Okay, well, I have been asked to talk about non-patent exclusivities, and um, I shall be focusing mainly on uh, two non-patent exclusivities, data exclusivity and market exclusivity. But I was asked also to talk a bit briefly about supplementary protection certificates, which are not, in fact, really a non-patent exclusivity because they are keyed to a basic patent. But I won't say too much about them because another aspect of the focus of my talk is uh, the degree to which regulatory exclusivities can be used to incentivize new uses uh, rather than the development of new molecules. And uh, for reasons I'll very briefly go through, uh, supplementary protection certificates are not really a terribly viable way of uh, incentivizing new uses. There's a lot of text on this slide to which I will not particularly speak, but uh, essentially supplementary protection certificates, which Catherine briefly referred to, requires a basic patent. So it's going to be subject to all the vagaries of the validity of the basic patent, and uh, you know, if you've got a basic patent for a use, you're subject to the problems uh, which Catherine outlined in particular. Uh, what is more with supplementary protection certificates, uh, the um, legislative framework was designed really to incentivize new molecules rather than new uses of old molecules. And um, you see this in Article 3 of the regulation down there. You can't get a new SPC. You can't get an SPC if the product has already had an S, if the product has an, already had an SPC for which it needs to have been had a marketing authorization. And the authorization must be to be in the first to place the product on the market anywhere. So it's not good for um, new uses for. Um, already authorized products. Uh, I mean, in the, ta in, in, in the context of uh, Tadalafil, it might be okay because the product had not previously been authorized for any other indication. So it, there again, it would only be, it wouldn't be the SPC framework which was problematic, it would be the underlying patent framework which was problematic. But even where you do have use patents, um, there have been attempts to get around the SPC framework, which is key to incentivizing new chemical entities rather than uh, new uses of the already authorized chemical entities. I've set out on this slide the case law in relation to that. First one, the Pharmacia case, shows how on, the, on a purely sort of literal reading of the SPC regulation, how uh, limiting that is. A, a, a marketing authorization as a, as a veterinary medicinal product uh, precluded getting an SPC in relation to a marketing authorization for a human medicinal product. Uh, there was then the case, a couple of more cases, Massachusetts Institute case, a very hard case, a very good demonstration of how inadequate the SPC system is actually in providing incentives. There was a drug which was toxic, uh, an anti-cancer drug which was toxic, until a way of providing a delivery mechanism in it using a sort of glorified sponge in the brain was developed. And no SPC could be sought, secured for that because this highly toxic drug, which became much less toxic in this delivery mechanism, was not actually, uh, you know, it, it wasn't a new marketing authorization. There had been previous marketing authorizations in other indications in which that toxicity could be, could be uh, dealt with. Uh, Neurim was a, a very special case we keep on going back to, which did actually suggest you could actually, even within the framework of the SPC system, get uh, an SPC for a new use for a previously marketed, uh, for a, a product which had previously had a marketing authorization. Um, that is being challenged, it's being cut back. In the Abraxis case, the Advocate General suggested that Neurim was wrong. The Court of Justice didn't, on the facts of that case, have to actually engage with that 
because it was a new formulation case, not a new use case. In the Santin case, again, the Advocate General has suggested that a urine was wrong. It looks as if, um, on the facts of this particular case, there are some new formulation aspects to it, but there are new indication aspects to it as well. It looks as if the Court of Justice may not be able to duck that, but uh, I think Sir Richard Arnold has lots of experience with the Court of Justice ducking questions on SPCs <laughs> to which they have been put, so we, we, we we'll just have to see. But that's essentially all I was going to say about SPCs. I don't hold out much hope for SPCs as um, a way of protect incentivizing new uses, Firstly, because they're key to a basic patent, which is subject to the vagaries of patent law. And secondly, because the SPC system is not designed itself to incentivize new uses. Now, here are two um, regulatory uh, exclusivities. Um, first one, data exclusivity, otherwise called regulatory data protection. Now, this protects the regulatory data you file, the clinical trial results that are filed in order to secure a marketing authorization. And so, it, so it's only protecting that data. So it doesn't actually preclude a second applicant doing its own clinical trials for the same indication or for other indications in relation to the same product. Um, now, that's very rare. Obviously, there is no real incentive to just to do this again. There are also ethical issues about repeating the same trials which have already been undertaken in the past and which you know pretty much the outcomes in relation to. But that's not to say it hasn't been done. And uh, there is certainly, uh, certainly a case in Europe where uh, a generic company got a particular indication in relation to a, uh, a, a cancer drug. Uh, during the protected term of exclusivity in relation to, during the data protection period for the product. Uh, we'll look at this in more detail. A couple of points, high, a couple of headline points to emphasize now. Regulatory data protection is mandated by TRIPS and with a lot more specificity by the various trade agreements you have being entered into bilateral trade agreements or multilateral trade agreements being entered into throughout the world, uh, because what is said in TRIPS, as we shall see, is a little bit vague. Um, it sort of has its origins back in attempts in days gone by to protect uh, clinical trials uh, data under trade secrets law. And indeed, even though you'll find the uh, mandate to protect data exclusive uh, mandate to protect regulatory data in Article 39 of TRIPS, where you also find the mandate to protect trade secrets. Um, I think it's important to see it as a very different sort of protection these days to trade secrets law. My reason for that is not only it has a separate legal basis, it's under a separate paragraph of Article 39 TRIPS. But also, um, there is this trend in recent years to much greater clinical trial transparency. So you can actually uh, get an awful lot of data in relation to the clinical trials which have been undertaken uh, as a result of freedom of information applications, uh, whether under the EU framework or in the US. Um, and indeed, now, in, in Europe, there's a particular portal which they're setting up to actually file uh, clinical trial results uh, with the regulatory authorities. Uh, it, it will very much be designed to facilitate that. Um, so I think it's important to decouple regulatory data exclusivity, regulatory data protection or data exclusivity from trade secrets law. Um, and indeed, there is soft law in the EU which says, which does decouple the two. It says you cannot use clinical data which has been disclosed for reasons of transparency to found your application for a marketing authorization. I think on an international basis, there's potentially more of a tr problem. You know, that in theory, one could, in certain other countries, which I would suggest are not actually implementing Article 39.3 of TRIPS, 
properly, uh, have, you can actually use, or there's nothing in particular to stop you using clinical trial data secured under freedom of information in, uh, in, in, the, in, in the European framework, but using that outside Europe. So I'll be talking more about regulatory data protection in practice in both Europe and a little bit in the United States. Secondly, there's market exclusivity, uh, which is um, and the distinction here, and we have this only for orphan medicinal products in Europe, um, it doesn't matter if the second applicant has undertaken its own clinical trials um, on the product. If you're talking about a marketing authorization which overlaps with that of the first applicant, you still don't get your marketing authorization for the period of exclusivity. You have an absolute market exclusivity. The first person to secure a marketing authorization for an orphan indication, that's an indication for a very small patient population, the first person to secure that uh, marketing authorization has exclusivity for the particular period of time which the legislation provides. And so you'll see from that point of view that is not challenged by greater clinical trial transparency. It's irrelevant that you can get the, uh, the, the clinical trial data from the first applicant in terms of uh, the second applicant securing uh, a marketing authorization. So the exclusivity is absolute that under data exclusivity is in practice pretty absolute in Europe, uh, as we shall see, but um, less so, uh, d d d there are sort of gaps in it, and particularly on an international basis. Here is Article 39.3 of TRIPS, to which I referred. Now, what you'll immediately see when you look at that, uh, particularly because it's been underlined, is that it is... Um, keyed to, or the, or the principle is of, da of data exclusivity, applies only in those cases where you have, you're talking about a marketing authorization for a new chemical entity. And thus, on the face of this, this is of little or no use in relation to protecting new indications. Uh, moreover, it's only mandated in respect of pharmaceuticals and agrochemicals. Um, and in fact, in Europe, uh, data exclusivity has been extended into other areas, such as new chemicals, uh, generally, uh, under the REACH uh, legislation, biocidal products, that'll be sort of a um, bit like agrochemicals, but for non-agricultural uses, and even things like health claims on food. Uh, so they each have their own different regulatory exclusivity framework, but each intended to incentivize uh, people to, uh, well, each of them require, each of these regulatory frameworks require applicants for marketing authorizations or for these health claims to put in data which supports those marketing authorizations or those health claims. And so what you're doing in these is protecting that data. So let's look in more detail at the system in Europe. So this is the what is called the 8 plus 2 plus 1 system. And it's a system we have had in place in Europe since 2005 for human medicinal products. Um, there was uh, a system in place before that, a sort of six year in some countries or 10 years in other countries or 10 years for centralized uh, marketing authorizations. Before that, uh, I was involved in a lot of litigation in the Court of Justice under that previous system, and it's quite interesting that the, um, one of the major shortcomings of the previous system, in that it did not show itself capable of providing an incentive for securing new indications, was one which was actually addressed in the legislation uh, which established this new system, which we've had since 2005. So here, as I say, it protects against the generic of a re reference medicinal product mm. for this eight plus two years. So the generic applicant cannot rely on the clinical data of the first applicant until eight years has passed 
when it can file its marketing authorization seeking to rely on that data. Then it can't actually get uh, a marketing authorization until a further two years has passed after that eight years. So effectively, the, um, first, the person who first secures a marketing authorization gets a 10-year period of exclusivity. Uh, and for example, uh, ICOS in relation to the Tadalafil case will have secured, irrespective of any patent protection, a 10-year period of market exclusivity from the first marketing authorization in Europe. Um, and uh, so where do new indications come into this? Well, if you, as a, the first applicant, uh, secure a new indication providing significant clinical benefit during the first eight years, you get an extra year extending your 10 years to 1 to 11 years across the board. You will now ask, who assesses what is a significant clinical benefit? That is done uh, within the uh, Committee on Human Medicinal Products, within the EMA, and they make an assessment of that. And they are essentially you know, medically qualified practitioners. And we'll see, and there have been cases where their assessments have been problematic, or there have been cases where their assessments have been challenged within the sort of framework provided for by this. There have been none, uh, yeah, sorry, yes, where they've been challenged within that framework. But that's the only protection you get within that system for new indications, uh, and they have to be new indications with a significant clinical benefit. Uh, it's also worth flagging up that if you've got two sort of separate applicants both working on the same molecule, they can both get sort of exclusivities under this in relation to their new indica their own indications on which they're working. Uh, the only problem, the only time you can't get an applicant, you can't get a protection for a new indication, is if the same applicant or related applicants are developing a new indication. Um, and we'll see a few references to that in the case law um, when we come to that. But before I come to that for completeness, there are another couple of uh, regulatory exclusivities in the legislation. This first one here, a new indication of a well-established substance, non-cumulative period of one year of data exclusivity, for new indications. Nobody knows what that means. That was introduced at the, by the politicians at the last stage of the legislation. I don't believe it has ever been used in practice. And so yeah, uh, we will talk no further about it. Change of legal status. Um, that is when you get uh, when you support the classification of a change from, for example, uh, prescription-only medicine to pharmacy, a uh, prescription medicine, prescription-only me prescription medicine to pharmacy-only medicine or general sale list medicine, um, and there are also provisions for pediatric use marketing authorizations where there is no other uh, pediatric uh, incentive. Normally, the paediatric incentive is keyed to uh, the SPCs, six-month six period of extension to an SPC. It is also keyed to orphan uh, indications as well when you get a two-year two extension uh, in those limited cases. Now, here, very briefly, are a number of cases in relation to um, regulatory data protection and data exclusivity for human medicinal products, uh, where you've had you know, determinations of it's important to actually establish that something is a new active substance so that it gets the 8 plus 2 and the potential of plus 1 protection. Uh, that was not the case in Sepracore. Uh, which was a, um, uh, the enantiomer of a previously authorised racemate that was held by the uh, regulatory authority not to be a new active substance. That was challenged in that case. It failed for procedural reasons. 
Uh, Tech Fitter and Albagio, if you dig into the assessment reports, very interesting cases, they're both multiple sclerosis drugs, very interesting cases where there were questions as to whether or not these were new chemical entities. Was one a metabolite of a previously authorized substance? In the other case, there had been some previously authorized mixture of substances, one of which was an ester of this, or one of which was the free acid of this. And there were yeah, and, and, and they were quite interesting. It's quite interesting to analyse the, uh, ass the assessment reports from how they came to the conclusion that these are new active substances. But when we're looking at new indications, uh, how do you assess this significant cl clinical benefit? How do the medics go about that? There have not been very many of these. Um, I've not got a complete listing of them. It's not terribly transparent in the EMA system. Torreso and Zytiga are both positive assessment reports. I'll talk a little bit more about Zytiga. There are some negative assessment reports there. Uh, one particular case to flag up and, and to emphasize the point I made, that even if you produce, if a company develops a new indication, it doesn't get any further and it's completely... You know, indication out of left field. It doesn't get any new protection for that beyond possibly the plus one across the board in relation to the marketing authorization. And that is demonstrated by the uh, Novartis cases. Although I think, I don't know, I, don't know, I thought those have, might have gone to the Court of Justice. So those are the general court references anyway. But I was going to give you a case study of Zytiga, which is quite an interesting one, particularly because it was a drug which was developed in the UK, uh, a major advance in the treatment of prostate cancer. But the new chemical entity itself was developed back in 1992, Institute of Cancer Research, funded by Cancer Research UK is it under, under its then name. And so, back in 1992, developed that new chemical entity patent filed, patent then licensed out uh, via NRDC or now BTG, and then licensee, I think it was Boehringer Ingelheim, large company, uh, eventually withdrew. There were problems about the sort of, there was nothing particularly wrong with the drug, but the mechanism of action was questioned. Uh, and um, then the people at ICR pushed back on that, eventually undertook some phase one trials, and the patent was licensed out again. Uh, and then uh, Johan de Bono at uh, ICR actually published a rationale for further studies to try and uh, overcome some of these prejudices and, and undertook, got some funding from a US startup to undertake some phase one, two client, clinical trials. Those showed promise, a use patent was filed, and eventually marketing authorizations were granted in 2011. That is tw nearly 20 years after the development of the new chemical entity patent itself, showing you once again, you know, these patents not terribly, not necessarily that much use in, in incentivizing this sort of activity. Um, especially as we will see that in 2016 the, Europe, the EP use patent was revoked by the EPO opposition division. We cannot just blame the English courts for revoking use patents. <laughs> I'll smile for over there. <laughs> um, and uh, indeed, this wasn't a, a vagary in this case of the, uh, the UK, of the uh, European Patent Office. Uh, and indeed, the appeal was subsequently withdrawn um, because the, in the States, um, the use patent was uh, revoked by the Patent Trial and Appeal Board um, and the CAFC, the appeal body there, uh, upheld that uh, last year. So you've got the use, you, the NCE patent's expired, use patent is, has been blown out of the water in both major jurisdictions. So where's data exclusivity come into this? Well, data exclusivity in the United States expired in 2018, and there are indeed generics on the product, on the market in 1918. 
Data exclusivity in the European Union does not, in fact, expire till 2022 because there's an 11-year period of protection for this and because it got a major a significant uh, a marketing author or an extension of marketing authorization offering significant clinical benefit. Uh, so that is a case study of not so much of protecting new uses, but of demonstrating uh, how effective data exclusivity can be, particularly as we have it in Europe, uh, in, re in comparison with uh, patent protection. Veterinary medicinal products, I've got relatively little time, but we'll, so we'll not say much about this, except to say that it, before 2005, it was the same, same system as we had for human medicinal products. They've tweaked it in 2005 to incentivize uh, new products for bees and fish, and indeed for new product uh, to to get product to extend the use of an already marketed or already authorized product into new food producing species. And the reference to MRL data that's uh, maximum residue li limits because when you've got uh, seeking marketing authorizations in relation to food producing spe species you have also to go into the sort of pesticide residues which are allowed in those, uh, in those uh, uh, food producing animals. Now there's no sign of any change to the uh, regulatory data protection regime for human medicinal products but we have as a result of the new veterinary medicinal products regulation last year uh, a new system for data protection in uh, Europe for veterinary medicinal products which is even more tailored to provide incentives for what are regarded as being desirable aims. Uh, new antimicrobial products for certain species. Bees, bees, the sort of, you know, the, the, the most favoured um, uh, animal of all. You can get up to 18 years regulatory data protection if you do something good for bees. Um, and... You know, the, the sort of standard for other species going back down to 14 plus potential of four extra years where you extend into each you know, with an extra year for each new species and so on and so forth. I won't go into the detail, but I make the point that you can really, and here's another bit of it in relation to new maximum residue, le uh, residue level data, and indeed um, you know, this antimicrobial and antiparasitic uh, tailoring. You can tailor regulatory exclusivities in a way which is not open to you with patents. So not only are you not subject to the vagaries of patent law and to the fact that patents have to be applied for too early, but also you're not subject to the rigidity of patent law. Um, orphan medicinal product exclusivity. Now this um, is gives you, as I said, a sort of absolute um, uh, market exclusivity, irrespective of whether a second applicant undertakes their own, uh, their own trials. Uh, and in Europe, it's for 10 years, uh, plus you can get an extension of two uh, in relation to uh, pediatric uh, studies. Um, it can be cut back to six years where, the, uh, where you make too much money, um, there are exceptions for inadequate supply or for similar products which provide a technical advance. So the exclusivity, it, again, the nature of the exclusivity, it does incentivize uh, technical development. There have been a couple of cases in relation to that, um, but I haven't got the time to go through those in detail. Uh, what I will make the point about, because it's always nice to have some chemistry, in these slides, is I emphasize at the top, it's against the same medicinal product, or in Europe, and there's a big difference from the United States, a similar medicinal product for the same indication. So what do I mean by similar? Again, this is assessed, it's not assessed by patent judges, it's assessed by uh, scientists, uh, by medics. And those two cancer treatments, uh, leukemia treatments, were regarded 
as being similar under the orphan medicinal products regime. You'll see they've got the same, basically the same left-hand side. Uh, but there are differences there, and I'd be interesting for the patent lawyers amongst you to speculate on, you know, whether even with our sort of brand new equivalents, etc., etc., in the UK, uh, those would be regarded as equivalent under that sort of framework, or even if having filed patent application justifying yourself on the basis of one of those, you would be allowed a breadth of claim which actually encompassed the others. I don't know, but this is what is being achieved or what can be achieved in the context of regulatory frameworks. Um, and why is this a good thing? Why is it a good thing to disincentivize similar products? Because the, why should you be incentivizing new chemical entities which are merely me twos, which don't actually provide any significant therapeutic benefit? You shouldn't necessarily, I mean, you know, in any way, if people want to do that, they've got a patent system that allows them to do that. But why should you be incentivizing that sort of uh, activity uh, with the regulatory system? In the United States, I don't have time to go through this in detail, but the periods are actually rather shorter, even though the headline period for new, for new chemical entity exclusivity in the States is five years. It is in practice because there's a patent linkage there, seven and a half years. Um, and they have their own orphan drug exclusivity, shorter term, but significantly different from that in Europe. It's only keyed to the same drug for the same indication, not similar, same or similar drugs for a new indication. They also have exclusivities for animal drugs. So, um, conclusions. Um, SPCs, not really a basis for incentivizing new indications. Um, regulated data protection and data exclusivity, um, not much of a protection for new indications, not much of an incentive for new indications, unless it does provide a significant... Uh, therapeutic benefit, um, and then you get you know, your extra year across the board, not just in relation to that indication. But it is, as in the case of Zytiga, a valuable incentive to seek the first marketing authorization for a product which has weak, old, or non-existent patent protection. And you can tweak it, as you've seen in the case of veterinary medicinal products, or for medicinal product ex marketing exclusivity, because by their very nature, orphan indications are indications. It's key to indications. It protects new indications, irrespective of how old the product is. Um, and it also protects, again, in Europe, at least against similar products and against Me Too work. So yeah. between them, those two regulatory frameworks, I suggest offer the way forward to some of the questions which have been posed in this session. Thank you very much.